I've been using Windows PCs my entire life. And while I have used a Mac here or there in the past, I've never been able to use it for more than a week or so before drifting back to my Windows devices because that's where I'm more comfortable. Now, generally in the past, Macs and Windows devices have been pretty similar in terms of capabilities and performance. And even though Macs have generally held a premium, it's because they're more premium devices. But some of that, that gap might change very soon here with the release of Apple Silicon. Now, granted, as I mentioned in my Surface Pro X review, Microsoft technically beat Apple to the punch in terms of delivering a desktop operating system on an ARM-based chip. But that is very much still a work in progress and we're still waiting on 64-bit um, app support. And Apple somehow announced that they'd be supporting 32-bit and 64-bit applications in what they call translation rather than emulation. But Apple's claim is that translating rather than emulating the apps will lead to more consistent performance and more comparable performance to if the application was running natively on an x86-based processor. Since Microsoft doesn't have as much control over their operating system relative to Apple, it's going to take some time before they can convert their own manufacturers over to ARM, if they even plan on doing so. And Apple, on the other hand, has the ability to control all Mac manufacturing such that they can build every single Mac running on ARM at once, and that's exactly what they're doing. Now what you see before me is the first culmination of that work. This is the MacBook Air running an M1 chip, which is Apple's first Apple Silicon chip. Now, frankly, I've never actually seen this model of MacBook Air or used it extensively before. And so when I get into it, please forgive me if I get really excited about small things like design that aren't necessarily new with this specific MacBook because Apple has manufactured this style of MacBook with Intel chips. But please be patient with that. And speaking of patience, I'm getting really impatient. I wanna break this open. Let's get right into it. So I notably got the base model of 13 inch MacBook Air. And granted, it's only eight gigs of memory and a 256 gig SSD, but I figured that would be good enough for my, uh, my use case, at least in terms of um, using this as an Ultrabook, which is my primary plan. I would love to be able to use this to fully replace um, some of the work that I'm doing on a desktop, but we'll have to see later on if that's possible. Okay, well, let's open this up and I'm going to get to this soon. It already feels pretty amazing. So you've got your manuals, you got your um, USB-C power cable, and I gotta see, this is 30 watts, which isn't a ton and generally wouldn't be good enough to probably power a, a traditional MacBook Pro or maybe a higher end MacBook Pro. But I imagine that 30 watts is, is enough for an Apple Silicon based Mac because obviously it's more than enough to, to power an iPad. Okay, we'll put that aside. And then finally, you've got your USB C to C cable. So we'll put these back in and we'll just get right to the MacBook. Okay. So admittedly, I would say that this is a little bit larger than I'd want. Um, the MacBook Air is notably larger than the MacBook Pro, thicker than the MacBook Pro, although it does uh, curve at the ends, so it appears thinner in some places. I don't think that's a big deal. This is still a very small Ultrabook. But I think for me, I start to prefer Ultrabooks that are ultra small, that are super small. And that's why I've started using a lot of two-in-ones instead for Ultrabook use, just because they're super portable. Okay, so here it is, and I have used MacBook Pros in the past, so I'm familiar with, or like the newer model of MacBook Pro, I am familiar with the aluminum like unibody top, which is like obviously very, very pretty and very seamless. 
Now I can see that there is a single headphone jack on one side, which is nice. And then two USB-C ports, which should do uh, USB 4, which USB 4 includes Thunderbolt 3. And so thankfully this should have Thunderbolt 3 capabilities. Now, one disappointment that I saw with this is it doesn't actually support external graphics cards, which is a little bit of a bummer for me, but I can understand that that's probably a niche use case for most people. And there's probably only a small amount of people that are actually using uh, external graphics cards with their MacBooks. Now, I'd like to think that um, MacBooks are meant for that, meant for, or at least MacBook Pros are meant for kind of professionals that might be, might need a little bit more horsepower. Um, but with Apple's claims of performance, it might not actually be needed. If the processor is that much more capable in not only terms of like typical CPU processing, but also in terms of graphics, it might not be necessary. I will say that... <laughs> I totally didn't see that coming. I... <laughs> it's a nice, nice experience as long as you're not in like a library or Maybe like uh, maybe in the middle of class, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone will just glare at you when that happens. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so there we go. It looks obviously the screen is is very impressive. Um, it's very high resolution, which is which is great. But I don't I don't think I'd notice a huge difference on a 13 inch screen between a 1080p and and whatever this is. Now I will say I have used some of the, the larger 16 inch MacBook Pros and, and the trackpads are noticeably like gigantic. Now this is still a very large trackpad and since I've usually used Surface products and, and Dell XPSs, the trackpad on those are, are quite a bit smaller. So this is a really nice departure from that, but frankly I don't think I will use the full space unless I really get into macOS. And that's very much gonna be my intention to, to try and use macOS as my primary operating system. Now, the biggest benefit that Apple claimed for the new MacBook Air is the fact that it's fanless. Now, and frankly, that is not really that innovative. This is definitely not the first device, uh, first laptop with a desktop operating system to be fanless. It's not even the first MacBook to be fanless. Uh, actually, the 12-inch MacBooks from a few years ago also were fanless because they ran um, Intel's Core M processors, which were notably not very powerful processors. But still, the fanless design was, was absolutely excellent on those, and I'm disappointed that Apple seems to be uh, sweeping that design under the rug because I think that design was excellent, and I, I kind of miss it, and I think it's, it's optimal for Apple Silicon. But, Maybe they'll bring back that design in, in future Apple Silicon models. But now, what might be innovative of the fact that it doesn't have a fan is the potential performance, at least the performance that Apple and, and some reviewers are claiming, which might make this completely innovative in terms of the amount of performance and heat dissipation needed for that performance. And I'll see in the coming weeks whether those claims are true. I'm going to use this device very differently than probably most reviewers. Now I will try and use it for video editing and photo editing like many reviewers will, but I'll also start using it for more what I'd call productive tasks like um, I'll use it for Microsoft Excel, I'll use it for some coding, I'll use it for some um, emulation. It, it's going to be kind of my, my be all end all device for the coming weeks, so we'll see if it is able to cover all my, all my uh, performance needs. Now, of course, Apple does include a fan with the MacBook Pro, which has the same processor. And it's odd because it seems like Apple's trying to have their pie and eat it too. But they claim that having a fan on the device actually adds a ton of performance in addition to unlocking an additional graphics core. Um, I'll have to see in the, in the actual results whether that's true. But I personally chose the MacBook Air for three reasons. First, it's cheaper, which isn't a huge deal for me. I think Apple devices uh, retain their value for long enough such that you're not actually losing a lot of money on the MacBook Pro if you do pay more for it. Second, what I love about the MacBook Air is the fact that it doesn't have the touch bar that the MacBook Pro has. While I think some people like the touch bar, 
I think it would be a, you know way too much of a departure for me coming from Windows laptops to have to deal with the touch bar, especially because in my own personal use, coding and Excel, I'm heavily dependent on the traditional F keys. And then the third benefit that I see in the MacBook Air over the MacBook Pro is the fact that it doesn't have a fan. And while this might seem counterintuitive because I am losing out on performance, I think I would always opt for a fanless design if I still get decent performance, which Apple claims it's going to be excellent here. And the reason is, is because I hate the experience of just using my device or my using my laptop on the couch and then all of a sudden the fan kicks in even though all I'm doing is browsing a couple open tabs in, in Chrome or something along those lines. I don't, I don't think I need that extra processing capability that is somehow driven by the fan being activated. So if I had a choice, I would, I would prefer a fanless design, which is exactly what I went with with the MacBook Air. So I find my first impressions of the MacBook Air to be incredibly positive. I really like this device so far as far as design. And I know that those of you that already have MacBook Airs or MacBook Pros are very familiar with its design, so I might be preaching to the choir here. But for those of you that use Windows laptops, I think you should know that this design is absolutely incredible and, and definitely in line, if not better, than some of the top tier Windows laptops. And for those of you like me who might be considering switching from Windows to Mac OS, I don't think you need to feel ashamed in doing so. I think Apple has created a very compelling product here and it's up to Microsoft and their partners to create a compelling um, answer to the MacBook Air. I think being a fan of a computer manufacturer is perfectly fine, but when your loyalty to that computer manufacturer gets in the way of your, your own experience and forces you to choose what might be an inferior product, I think that starts being a problem and, and you're only sacrificing your own experience. And so that's exactly why I'm trying the MacBook Air. Not necessarily because I know it's going to be better, but because I want to make sure that I'm not sacrificing my own experience in opting for Windows laptops. And so it's going to be a huge transition to even figure that out. So the next couple weeks, I'm going to be working on a few different videos that center kind of around the MacBook Air. The first, of course, is going to be a traditional review where I evaluate the MacBook Air on its merits in terms of design, screen, keyboard, mouse, all those things. And then another video is going to be around the switching experience. Since I have a background with Windows, I think this is going to be definitely a transition and I kind of want to walk y'all through what my experiences was like so you can make a decision on whether you want to, you know, walk that road. And then the final video or videos that I'll do is compare the MacBook Air directly with the Surface Pro X, which is kind of its antonym in terms of offering a desktop operating system on ARM. And I'll also compare it against some other popular Windows laptops to establish whether the MacBook Air is competitive at its $1,000 price point. So thanks for watching y'all. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a little bit different than some of the other videos I posted. If you liked it, be sure to like and subscribe and, and let me know down in the comments what you think of Apple Silicon and the MacBook Air or really whatever else. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.